Hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're watching us from. Welcome to Health Talk Mondays and I'm your lead host Isaac Yami and I'm excited to be here today. As usual, health is a choice and we always choose to be healthy on this show. So today, like always, we're going to have a very exciting program and I want to welcome every single one of you and please do tell us where you're watching us from and please do share the stream, like, subscribe and do everything that is great and you share this. So like, like why is every single time I always have um, co-hosts and I'm always excited to, to be with them in a, an amazing panel. So I'm going to welcome my co-host Gami and Grulu. Hello, 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 everyone. Hello, Isaac. Hello, hello Miss Grilu. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, we miss hello, uh, hello. we miss uh, Grilu the past uh, few episodes, and we're very glad to have yes. her back again in our session this Monday. Hello, Isaac. How are you doing? I'm Greetings great, of uh, Christian love and charity to all our viewers throughout the world, wherever you are watching. We wish you health. We wish you happiness, and we welcome you to today's wonderful episode of our health talk. This is Gami Valencia, um, greeting you from uh, Wolverhampton, West Midlands in the United Kingdom. Awesome. Hello, Welcome back, Ms. Grilu. It's good to be back. I was yes. off like, the past few episodes, busy with family affairs. I bring you warm greetings from the Valley in South Texas. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And my name is Grelu. I'm glad to be here. I'm one of your co-hosts. I bring you greetings from McAllen, Texas. I am a nurse by profession and a health educator and partner at Selena Wellness Consultancy and Health Speaks Wellness Seminar. We are a self-supporting health ministry promoting health and wellness. I'm so happy to be here. I'm glad to be back. I wish everybody good health and may we have a blessed day listening to our health lectures. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome yeah, back. Wonderful. Yeah, um, uh, I think for the information of everybody, our lead host, Isaac Yami, is broadcasting live to us all the way from the eastern part of Cyprus. And so it's yes. exciting that in different parts of the world, God in his wisdom has allowed us to come together uh, in different time zones, in different uh, parts of the equator, with one very important purpose, which is to spread God's mission of health to everywhere and everyone in the world. Isaac, uh, may I have the honor of offering uh, the opening prayer before we proceed with our session today? Sure thing. Go ahead. Let us bow our heads. Our gracious and kind Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity of being here again, for the protection that you have given each and every one, for the good health that you have planted in us and you have reminded us to take care of. Thank you for our um, host and uh, the time that you have given him today to conduct a very important topic about uh, foods that heal. May those that are listening will be inspired and this session will be a life-changing experience for everyone. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers, dear Father, in the loving name of Jesus, we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Gami, for that powerful prayer. And I wanna welcome everyone once again, if you're just joining us, you haven't missed anything, and if you're going to watch us later on, it's still great and still fine. And today we're going to be talking about food that heals and the significance of learning this topic upon health, wellness, and the wholeness of the body, mind, and spirit. And I'm going to give this opportunity to, to Ms. Gurulu to introduce our presenter as always. Okay, so our presenter this morning is Dr. Jerry Tamayo. He has a PhD in biomedical genetics and nutritional biochemistry. He is a biology professor at South Texas College. He teaches human anatomy and physiology as well as nutrition and diet therapy. 
He has given lectures on plant-based nutrition locally in Texas and in different states, okay, in the, as well as in Canada and the United States and the United Kingdom, as well as his home country, the Philippines. He is the founder and speaker of Health Speaks Wellness Seminar, a ministry dedicated to sharing the Seventh-day Adventist health message. He is a loving son, husband, and father, and above all, a man of God who is very passionate about the health message. Let's give the time to Dr. Edwin Jerry S. Tamayo. Dr. Tamayo? Hello, how are you? How's everyone? We're I'm good, Dr. How are you? How are you, Professor Isaac? I'm doing great. I'm doing Very great, Dr. Good. Yeah, we are just so inspired to help all of you, uh, including uh, uh, Mr. Grammy and, of course, uh, Ms. Grilu, uh, who has been with me for the past how many years, Mommy? Uh, 26 years. 27 years. 26 years. <laughs> 26, going 27 years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we have been good friends as well. And uh, uh, we just celebrated uh, our, uh, our children's success uh, for the past two weeks. That's why she wasn't here. And I'm glad that we are here all together again to do the health talk. In fact, um, uh, it will be announced later that uh, we will go on for a, a summer break after this episode. And um, uh, we, our co-hosts will elaborate on this, and this will be a formal announcement. But I'm so glad that we are here. I would like to greet all our viewers, all our uh, 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 regular viewers around the world in UK, in different countries, including some countries in Africa, Australia, even Singapore. There are those who are uh, viewing us in the Philippines and, of course, here in the United States. And we are so glad that we are back. Greetings from McAllen, Texas, where we are broadcasting live with JesusLive.io Health Talk. Good morning and good afternoon. Good evening, Good evening. <laughs> to all of you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamayo, for that warm welcome again. And it's always a pleasure to always see you here. And we know that we're going to receive so much knowledge and our viewers are going to be blessed as always. So I just want to remind our viewers that, as always, it's OK to comment in our comment section. Give us questions. At the very end of the program, we have a and a If you want to understand or you want something to be clarified, we are there. We would love to engage with you all the time. So please do feel free to um, use our comment section and then please like, also um, comment and give your questions as we go on with the program. So to move on, I am going to hand this time over to Dr. Tamayo to lead us into today's presentation. Our topic for this more for this uh, time is foods that heal. I like this one because this is very central to our health. You see, if we are going to look at uh, the different fruits and vegetables, they are the ones that actually uh, should be partaken on a daily basis that will heal all our maladies. I would like to stress the word all, because basically, if we have any of these diseases or any disorders, that you just have to eat the right kind of food, except for some others, for example, congenital, congenital disorders, then they have to be treated on the right manner as well. Now, is as we advance to the next uh, slide, we would see here that there are plant foods that are the most powerful disease modifying tools, most powerful treatment and drug right. surgeries. And it says here in, um, in our uh, uh, presentation that according to Hippocrates, 
he said that let food be thy medicine. It means that it, the, the food that we have to eat should have healing power and not medicine or the drugs be thy food. And as we advance, it says here also uh, by uh, a researcher, a uh, one who has advocacy on plant foods, he said that correct plant-based medicine can fix, treat, prevent, and cure the most menacing modern diseases, even cancer. So uh, here in the next slide, you will see here that, that you may have uh, some thoughts about what co could be the plant foods that we have to eat. Now, as you may advance here in our slide, it says here that whole grains, the vegetables and fruits, and then the grains, the, the, the nuts, the seeds, the legumes are the ones which we have to partake every day in order for us to live better. In fact, our nourishment comes basically from plant foods. Now you may ask, what about the animal foods? You see, animal foods basically were permitted for us to partake temporarily at the time when there were no vegetation after the Noah's flood. So then we have to go back to the original diet, which are the grains, the vegetables, the fruits, the legumes, nuts, and seeds. And this, uh, in our presentation, we will be looking at some of the important foods that we can daily integrate in our diet. And also, uh, as we note that the, the processed foods, as we uh, uh, pounded very well in our past uh, presentations, that we should not be eating those animal foods these days, especially because they are not safe to be eaten. And that includes also those processed foods, uh, meat, dairy, and dairy products, poultry and poultry products, and generally all the processed foods. As we uh, pointed here, that they are actually uh, platforming. They are not giving good things for the body. So then if we advance to the next slide, you would see here that there are just a lot of benefits of uh, eating the plant foods. Uh, you can advance some more, Professor uh, Isaac, on the benefits of eating the plant foods. They are important for as immunity to heart attacks. Uh, they are there to avoid strokes, hypertension, obesity, osteoporosis, adult onset diabetes, senility, protection from cancers, and that you never have to count the number of calories that you have to uh, count. And you don't worry on weight gain. And uh, uh, here, these are just a number of benefits. Now, in the next slide, I would like us to, uh, to uh, integrate in our diet the following foods. So I would like to, uh, to point out here that these foods generally are important for cardiovascular health. Uh, why do I uh, focus here on cardiovascular health here? Because many of us, actually the number one killer in the United States and all over the world is heart disease, okay? Cardiovascular disease in general. So I would like to, to uh, uh, focus in my presentation here that there are some foods that would give uh, good health to our heart and our uh, vascular system, the blood system. And that if the cardiovascular health is, is uh, number one in our uh, list for health, then all of the other parts of the body are taken care of. All right, so let's look at the, the blueberries and uh, the different berries, as we know, blueberries, uh, strawberries, raspberries, and some other ver berries. They are rich in flavonoids. And specifically, we found out 
uh, some of these anthocyanins under the category of flavonoids, and they prevent in hardening of the arteries. And they remove the fatty plaques that have been deposited there. So for example, for people who may have narrowing of the arteries because the, there have been some deposits uh, or calcification, fat uh, that has been calcified on the walls of the arteries, they could be removed by just eating a handful or two of the berries in our daily diet, particularly for breakfast. Now, in the next slide, you will see also here that there are pulses that could lower blood pressure, they lower cholesterol level, they help to avoid weight gain, they balance blood sugar, and they decrease the risk of heart disease and cancer as well. So what are these pulses? Basically, these are seeds. These are dried seeds. You know, seeds are, are uh, uh, made by God in order to per perpetuate the same kind of plant as we plant them. But some extra seeds, the seeds that we don't uh, plant, we can make use of them as food. And thus, if we if we make them tender, tender, basically we just uh, uh, boil them until tender and then we put some vegetables there and some spices, some herbs, and uh, we call them basically as pulses. For example, lentils. Lentil stew, we can have mung bean stew and some others. We put the vegetables and some of the uh, uh, um of the vegetables and herbs that we may have. You see, in our presentation here, we cook the seeds, we cook the mung bean or, or lentils, for example, or other seeds. And then after we cook, before we put the vegetables, we have to withdraw it from the heat so that the, the health-giving nutrients of the, of the vegetables will not be destroyed. Okay, so let's eat the pulses, um, basically for dinner, as I recommend. And then in the next slide, we have the garlic. Garlic inhibits coronary artery calcification, and thus it would reduce the formation of fatty plaques. I would recommend one to two cloves of garlic a day. We can put it in our salads. We can put it in our smoothies so that this could take care of any possible deposition of uh, uh, fat on the arteries. And this would uh, not harden because garlic will neutralize the calcification effect of uh, calcium on the fatty plaque. Now, the next one is uh, uh, the grapes. We have grapes all over the world. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, grapes there in the Philippines already. And the grapes are endowed with a lot of flavonoids, quercetin, and resveratrol. And they are basically concentrated on the skin, in the skin of these uh, grapes, uh, along with the stems and the seeds of the grapes. So uh, let's not throw the skin. Let's not throw the seed if we eat the grapes. And then we can also get them from stems. So, for example, if there are, if you are going to uh, prune the grapes, if you have any uh, uh, vineyard, then get the 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 leaves, even the leaves, and then the stems. You just put them as part of your juice, and you get this flavonoids, quercetin, and resveratrol, and they are important in preventing formation of fatty plaques, and thus they lower the risk of developing heart disease and even blood clots. Now in the next slide, we have apples. Apples are rich in pectin. And these uh, pectins are soluble fibers that would lower our cholesterol. They interfere in the intestinal absorption of bile and thus this would force the liver to use circulating cholesterol to make more bile. And thus, the amount of cholesterol will lower in the bloodstream. They have special types of phytochemicals, as we call them, such as quercetin and even pectins. 
all right? And then they have potassium, magnesium, and they are important in keeping your blood pressure under control. In other words, your blood pressure will just go back to normal. If you eat one apple a day, as uh, it says the adage, an apple a day drives the doctor away, which means that you don't uh, get sick, basically, if you eat at least one apple per day. Now, in the next slide, we have spinach. Spinach, they are rich in lutein, which is a type of carotenoid that would protect some, uh, 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 that would protect us from age related macular degeneration. This one is a, an eye disorder that if we have high lutein in, the, uh, in our diet, such as eating the spinach, all the green leafy vegetables have high lutein content as well, not only spinach. And uh, they prevent macular degeneration because of their lutein content. And then they help in preventing heart attacks. It clears away the cholesterol buildup on the walls of the arteries. Aside from that, they are high in potassium and folic acid, which would be important in building our defense system. And thus, it will prevent you from uh, developing disorders such as hypertension, heart disease, and even diabetes. Now, the next uh, one in this slide is uh, olive oil. Olive oil have monosaturated and saturated fatty acids. Now, just a, uh, a quick uh, a recommendation here that if you use olive oil, don't use it too much. Just a teaspoon or two per day should be important and it prevents oxidation of cholesterol. It prevents uh, the, uh, the uh, fatty plaques to stick on the arterial walls, and thus there would be general prevention of fatty plaque development. The next are the tomatoes. Tomatoes have high amounts of carotenoid called lycopene, which is basically an antioxidant, which would lower as well your risk of developing atherosclerosis by 50%, and it prevents hardening of the arteries. Tomatoes are found everywhere, and it's easy to grow, actually. You can have your own tomatoes at your backyard, and we are starting to grow some tomatoes at our backyard as well. And if we eat them fresh from the garden, it would be much better, and this would avoid hardening of the arteries by about 50%. Then we have uh, uh, the blueberries. I mentioned this uh, earlier, but I would like to point out here that they also fight in hardening the arteries. Uh, it, yes, and they reduce blood vessel damage. They reverse the progression of artery disease and they stimulate the production of nitric oxide that would keep the arteries open and keep the blood flowing. So this is important to one. You see, the nitric oxide are uh, vasodilators. So the, uh, the linings of the blood vessels have uh, cells, what we call the endothelial cells, and they produce nitric oxide with the presence of uh, some phytochemicals coming from blueberries and even nuts, as we will see in the next uh, uh, slides. So you can see here, uh, for nuts, we need a handful of nuts every day. And uh, for particularly walnuts, almonds, I don't know if in other countries it's easy to get any of these nuts. Any nuts would do. Peanuts included. In the Philippines, we have uh, different nuts as well. But unfortunately, walnuts and almonds are just so uh, limiting in terms of the prices. So uh, in the next slides, you will see here that there are a lot of micronutrients that you find in nuts and seeds that would assist in lowering LDL. They increase the HDL level and they stabilize arterial walls. Then we have uh, uh, these nuts to uh, decrease the, or prevent or reverse the cardiovascular development of cardiovascular diseases. Now, just to point out again in, in the next slide that 
uh, nitric oxides that uh, we basically uh, produce through our endothelial cells will need some of this uh, amino acids coming from nuts and seeds in order for them to develop uh, the uh, nitric oxide. So in the next slide, you will see here that uh, the nitric oxides that are produced by the endothelial cells are actually uh, made based on the presence of L-arginine. This is a type of amino acid that we get from legumes, from beans, from soy, and some nuts. So in order for them to, uh, for the endothelial cells to produce nitric oxide, this uh, will require the presence of an L-arginine from these sources, from the nuts, from the beans, from legumes, basically. So that with the presence of uh, nitric oxide, the bl blood vessels will be open. They are dilated to a certain extent, okay? And thus, we can do away with any of these uh, diseases, development of cardiovascular disease particularly. Now, after we tackle the cardiovascular diseases, I would like to uh, go to those plants that have sugar lowering properties. So in the next slide, you will see here that plant extracts from medicinal plants had been used for several years for treating num numerous health disorders. And this includes diabetes. Why do I focus here in my presentation about diabetes? Because this is also found across cultures. And the number of diabetic patients have increased so much that uh, many uh, who uh, may have complications of the diabetes may die because of this. All right, so uh, let's look at some of the uh, foods that may integrate in our diet in order to lower our um, uh, the blood sugar back to normal. So in the next slide, you will see here, the first one, which is my favorite, is the okra. Um, well known as uh, Abel Muchos, Muchos uh, Escolentes, scientifically named as uh, Abel Muchos Escolentes. And this has been found to have anti-hyperglycemic properties. In other words, it could lower your, your blood sugar to a certain extent. Not just, uh, just a precaution here, since... Uh, these fruits and vegetables, as we will uh, uh, present here, have sugar-lowering properties. You also have to limit your intake of them. Not because you have diabetes, for example, that you eat just a lot of okra. If you, if you go beyond one plateful of okra in your dish, in your diet, uh, for one meal, then... Uh, the tendency is your blood sugar to become very, very low. So you may suffer from hypoglycemia. So just a warning here that if you are going to eat okra or some other plants that have uh, uh, sugar lowering properties, you have to limit your intake. Just like how we uh, pointed out that uh, temperance is key you have to see to it that you set some limits in your eating and eating habits. Now in the next slide, we have one which is very common across cultures and across nations. We have allium sepa, or this is more known as onion. And this is a spice that belongs to a family Liliaceae. And that, uh, in other words, this is, uh, under the family of lilies, all right? And onion has been used for treating various types of diseases, including diabetes. Again, just a warning that if they have a sugar lowering effect, then you have to limit it uh, into just a small amount, especially for herbs and for, uh, for those plants that have a strong, uh, a strong flavor and a strong properties they have to be limited to a certain extent, okay? And allium sepa has uh, been known to regulate 
the hypoglycemic activity, which is associated with diabetes mellitus. And Dr. it has Dr. some... Uh, yes. Dr. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I make a suggestion? Because uh, I think our readers, as I myself would, uh, would love to know, like how much of this is uh, ideal for a day? Because I think it might be difficult for us to go back to each everyone. Like you say, a plateful of okra, for example, two cloves of, of garlic a day would be ideal. One piece of apple. Um, I think if, if I could request, if you will just make an addendum to how much garlic or onion can we partake healthily in a day, it would it would aid our, our listeners, I think. Okay, yes, very good. Very good, uh, Mr. Gami. Thank you for that. You, you see, four... Uh, yes, uh, a, a clove or two of garlic a day, one apple a day, and then uh, what else did I mention? Uh, okra is just uh, one serving, just one, one serving. Don't go beyond two servings. So in your well, one, one, serving. one serving would be just a small uh, salad plate, salad plate with other ingredients. So for example, you cannot just eat uh, okra by itself, right? So you can put some other vegetables there. So that would be one serving. So in other words, if you are going to count the number of okra that you put there, about three to five pieces of okra. All right. What about the onions? Onions would be half, one fourth to one half cup after you have, uh, you have chopped it into, uh, into bits then you can serve only one fourth to one half cup per day okay all right now let's move on to the milk thistle milk thistle is originally from the mediterranean before spreading to other parts of the world and that uh, if you squeeze the leaves they produce the milky sap which uh, suggests its name milk thistle and milk thistle belongs to the daisy family, and it contains a polyphenol antioxidant compound uh, known as the uh, uh, silymarin that helps to control blood sugar level. Uh, we are not uh, so familiar with the milk thistle for many of us, but if you find a milk thistle, then you can get it, harvest it, and just squeeze uh, the leaves, and that. Uh, uh, you can serve only uh, for for us to have uh, a, a sugar lowering effect. You can have only a teaspoon, a teaspoon of its extract per day. Okay, and then for Google, Google uh, in the next slide is uh, another name for the oligom resin, or uh, scientifically known as the Comifora mucol. And this is popularly used in Asia for producing herbal medicine for treating diabetes. You see, uh, this uh, uh, the uh, resin of the oligom is a yellowish substance that is characterized by its balsamic odor. And each tree produces up to about 900 grams of the resin. It has some uh, Google sterols and they are active ingredient uh, that we find in Google. So uh, in the next slide, Google extracts are highly effective in controlling blood sugar level. And that, again, just uh, a reminder that we need, if you are going to take an extract of this, you, can, you may need only about half a teaspoon of the Google extracts. And it has some of this um, uh, phytochemicals such as uh, the cumiferic acid, the gugolipid, and some others. Um, and they are important for cholesterol and for glucose metabolism. All right, another, uh, another plant is the luquat. I don't know how uh, others would pronounce it, but I myself, in the next slide, you will see uh, the luquat which is botanically grown, known as the Eriobotrya haponica. So this is just a, a scientific name. And this plant belongs to the rose family. So the Lokwat tree grows up to 30 feet with evergreen leaves that are between three to five inches wide and five to 12 inches long. The Lokwat leaf has properties that could lower your sugar level. So you just get the leaves, get the extract, or you may just boil 
about three to five uh, leaves, boil it in one glass of water, and that you drink it in the morning, particularly. Now, why in the morning? Because at the time when the sugar level may tend to go up, then uh, this is the time when you may take the extract or you may uh, drink a tea coming from the lukewat leaf. So the lukewat leaf contains polysaccharides and uh, triterpenes, triterpenes uh, which uh, are especially uh, the tormentic acid that has been proven to uh, boost the insulin production of our pancreas and thus there would be lowering of the sugar level. Now in the next slide, let's go on to uh, the next uh, uh, plant. And we call this as the banaba. Banaba, in the Philippines, we have a lot of this. We have uh, a lot of trees of banaba. And uh, this is um, more known scientifically as the larger stromia speciosa. And it belongs to the family of the Rithraceae family. And banaba is also known as queen's crepe myrtle, a pride of India or queen's flower. And it is often used as an herbal medicine for treating diabetic patients. So basically, uh, the banaba leaves are big. So you can only use one leaf, just one leaf, uh, the more or less mature leaf, not too old, not too young. So just boil one leaf in one glass of water and you drink that in the morning. So it has some blood sugar lowering effect and it is also important in activating the pancreas in making insulin in order to metabolize your glucose. Now the next one, we have cinnamon. Cinnamon is a spice from the inner bark of many trees of the genus Cinnamomum, cinnamomum, which is widely used in food preparations. So uh, in some cases, we find the sticks, the cinnamon sticks. We may also find the cinnamon powder. I would recommend the use of the cinnamon sticks. Now, uh, in the cinnamon sticks, uh, it depends on how long it is. You need only about uh, one inch or two. Boil it in one to two glasses of water and drink the tea of it. And it has, uh, the, that's uh, in the morning again. Uh, it could be used as a pre-breakfast and thus it will lower your sugar level. Now the next one, we have the Garcinia cola, which is a flowering plant that belongs to the Gotriferi or the uh, Clociae family. And it is known as Adi, Heckle, uh, Namihin, Agbilu, Orogbo, Goro, and some others. So there are other names. I'm not so particular, par familiar with this plant, but this is found in Southeast Asia as well. Now, Garcinia extract is highly nutritional and is also medicinal. And it has hypoglycemic properties as well with uh, some compounds that you find uh, in them, such as the tannins, sap saponins, and the glycosides. Glycosides, I'm uh, uh, here. So the extract, you can get only half a teaspoon of extract per day in order for you to lower the sugar level. Now, the next uh, is we have garlic. We have garlic. Uh, as I mentioned, this garlic has also uh, properties that would remove the fatty plaque formation. And also it has properties to just uh, simply prevent the sticking of uh, fatty plaques on the walls of the arteries. But aside from that, garlic, when taken one to two cloves per day, this could affect uh, uh, normal gl blood glucose in the bloodstream. All right, and also, as we know that garlic has volatile sulfur compounds, such as the allyl uh, mercaptan, or we call this as the allicin, and this is important in preventing uh, uh, blood clots. It also prevents the body from developing cholesterol plaque or fatty plaques, as we mentioned, and it lowers the uh, development of diabetes. Now the next, we have the green tea. 
green tea. I I'm not sure uh, uh, for about uh, where they produce the green tea, but this is basically a a tea that is available in the market. It's uh, uh, widely available in the market in the grocery, but I think most of them are produced in China and in Southeast Asia, and that they get the leaves. They they just uh, uh, dry the leaves and make some teas out of it uh, produced from a plant called the Camellia sinensis. And uh, this could prevent the risk of developing type 2 diabetes and also it reduces your possibility to develop insulin resistance. It has some uh, uh, phytochemicals such as uh, polyphenols and uh, the epigo uh, galo uh, cate uh, cate catechin 3 gallate this is uh, just tongue twisting and this uh, this is a phytochemical that we find in green tea and this is associated to prevention of oxidative stress inflammation and diabetes the next plant is the lycoris which is a root of uh, the Gly Glycerus uh, galabra, which is a herbaceous perennial ligum. And the Lycoris root is effective in treating diabetes type 2 as well. And it has uh, uh, the phytochemical called Amor fruitins, which is known to reduce the sugar level and it prevents inflammation, especially among diabetics. All right, another plant, we have the uh, Jim Hima sylvester, which is a, a tropical tree under the family Apocynaceae and genus uh, Gymnema. And uh, we get the leaf extract and this lowers uh, blood sugar levels. So again, if you get the leaf extract, you just uh, squeeze it and that if you produce half a teaspoon that will be enough to lower your blood sugar level. And then we have, uh, this is one of my favorite in my, in my salads as well. Uh, then in the next slide, we find here the Momordica charantia. And uh, we know this as the bitter gourd or the meat bitter melon. In the Philippines, we more know this as Ampalaya. And it has uh, important properties to treat or lower diabetes. And we can make use of the leaves, the fruits, and the seeds. For the leaf extract, again, you can have half a teaspoon to one teaspoon of it, or you can make salads out of it as well. So this is important in lowering your blood sugar level, and it avoids or prevents inflammation as well. In the next slide, you see also the juniper berries that contain natural insulin, and thus they have um, a sugar lowering, lowering uh, properties. Now for juniper uh, berries, you can only eat a handful of them. So if you get just like uh, for the other berries, you can eat only a handful per meal, especially in the morning. And then we have the cayenne pepper. All right, the cayenne, we all know the cayenne pepper. And that's, this has been used traditionally for treating diabetes. So in the next slide, you will see here the cayenne pepper, which has a phytochemical called uh, capsaicin. And this would uh, cause the pancreas to produce insulin normally. Now, how much could you use for cayenne? You use only a pinch or two, okay? Not a teaspoon this time, but you can use only a pinch or two. Don't overdo it because this will have burning sensation on the uh, linings of the tongue down to the linings of the esophagus and also the, uh, the digestive tract. So you use only a pinch or two in every preparation. All right, so for the fenogreek, uh, in the next slide, this is more known as the Trigonella uh, Punom uh, Grecum, 
And this is an annual plant that belongs to the family of the Fabaceae. And its seeds are widely used as a spice for culinary purposes. Its leaves as vegetables and uh, the uh, dry leaves also could be used as tea. Now you use only one preparation of tea and that's good for, for a cup. All right, and it contains some hypoglycemic properties in order to treat diabetes. Then in the next slide, we have uh, ginseng, which has uh, sugar lowering properties. So for ginseng, you can use only um, uh, a small amount. For ginseng extracts, you may use only half a teaspoon of it. Then in the next slide, you have aloe vera. Many of us know this uh, very well, aloe vera, which uh, at times we use it as ornamental plant. So please uh, roll on to the next slide. And we can use it for burns. Uh, it has some anti-inflammatory properties, antiseptic properties. It has antioxidant properties and it has antibacterial properties. And it is also used uh, as important uh, food as anti-diabetic. All right, now how much could we use for aloe vera? We use aloe vera only just uh, from the leaf alone. If it is the medium size, we need only one inch of it. And then we put it as part of our salads, maybe in our fruit juices, in our, uh, in our uh, smoothies, we can put just an inch of it. You can remove uh, the, the, uh, the outer skin but you don't have to remove it if it is a tender one, then just uh, put it as part of your smoothies or your salads. Then the next, we have the fig leaf extract. It has some hypoglycemic properties. It has also some anti-tumor properties and it uh, aids in treating ulcers. Then we have the acacia or the bubble or the Indian gum tree and uh, they are known to have anti-diabetic properties as well. And they have lowering uh, uh, properties for triglycerides and uh, for weight loss, effective in weight loss program. Then we have the blueberry leaves. They have anthocyanin that uh, would be important in lowering the blood sugar. So we have some more here. I meant just uh, would like to uh, just mention them, such as the nigella or the black seed, the sage, and so on. All right. So these are some of the of the uh, plants that we have uh, for today. And uh, if you may have questions from our co-hosts, uh, then we will address from there. Yeah. Um... Is there a rule of thumb, something that could summarize, Doc, for the, um, uh, for the benefit of those that are listening and even for us here that are present? Um, if, you could, if you could give us a rule of thumb or, or some, some kind of a shorthand to uh, help us to remember what are the foods that uh, should be eaten, eaten and to partake and uh, what are the foods that uh, we should avoid? Yes, thank you, Gami, for that. Uh, you see, we have to focus basically on plant foods, including the vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, seeds, and nuts, as we mentioned in our uh, presentation, that we have to eat majority in our food. But we have to, to uh, see to it that we are eating them in a variety. So, for example, if you have berries, you have uh, uh, other fruits, you can combine them in such a way that you have varieties of fruits and vegetables here. And we must see to it that if we eat any of these foods, then we have to exclude as well some of the things like uh, refined foods, those foods that have added sugars with white flour and processed oils. And we must pay attention to the quality of the food with, uh, uh, as we are proposing here, that it should be whole, plant-based foods. And uh, if we could find them locally sourced, organically uh, produced, that would be very important. 
Now, I don't know if we could show in our slide here the uh, raw food pyramid, if we could ask uh, Professor Gami to show on the raw food pyramid uh, on the slide. So I would like us to point out here that aside from the plant foods that uh, we mentioned, as you roll, uh, roll here, um, uh, you go down, down to the slides, uh, Professor Gami, uh, Professor I Isaac. Uh, yes, uh, roll it down to the uh, food pyramid. Ah, uh, yeah, all right, okay, so you can see here the food pyramid. And this is one important rule of the thumb that if you want to be healthy, you have to emphasize uh, the plant foods. And primarily, as you can see in the in this slide, that you need to have the greens as the base of your food preparation per day. And then you can have other vegetables and the fruits that uh, we mentioned uh, make them as variety, and then less of the oils or the herbs as well. So what you will do is see to it that you make a variety of that. Uh, for example, for greens, you may have two to three types of greens, and then um, uh, you may have uh, vegetables in your diet, other vegetables, and then fruits, and some others. Now, if we go, go down to the next slide, you will see basically the same. And this is what I advocate here, the use of the vegan diet, and that you will see, uh, it's not the greens act, uh, actually that uh, we find here as the base, it's water. But then I will show you a, uh, a way by which we can make use of all these uh, fruits and vegetables in a manner that uh, we don't have to partake them in one meal. So let's roll down to the next slide. Uh, it shows you the same thing. It shows you the, the greens and then as, uh, yes, uh, please roll down to the next slide, uh, Professor Isaac. Uh, there are things that we need to avoid here uh, before we go to the, to the uh, meal plan. Okay, so that this gives the, an idea for many of our viewers what to eat and how do we schedule. So then we have here uh, things to avoid. Refined sugars, as we have been saying, including products of refined sugars, such as soda, cakes, chocolates, candies, and others. Refined oils, trans fats, meat, cheese, dairy, and dairy products, poultry and poultry products, if possible canned, baked, and grilled, and processed foods if possible, then white bread, white rice, and other starch foods if possible. Let's try to avoid any of this. All right. Now, in the next slide, you will see here a plan. This is just a, a, a plan here that for, uh, for the teas, for example, uh, aside from water, you drink first your two glasses of water before you drink your, you eat your breakfast. And before you uh, take a pre-breakfast, uh, these are the teas that you may include. For example, water with the lemon, or if you have cinnamon tea or those uh, green tea, you can include them as pre-breakfast. Now, the breakfast should emphasize on the fruits, nuts, tubers, and the grains. So you can schedule, if you have fruits there and the tubers, eat first the fruits. For the nuts, you may have just a handful of nuts, then you can integrate with the fruits, and then later on you can eat the tubers and the grains. For lunch, you emphasize on the vegetables, the seeds, and the neutral food, fruits. And for dinner, I mentioned about this stew earlier, uh, the lentil stew, um, the pulses, you can have the, them together with some legumes. Now in the next slide, I would like you to uh, visualize how you can prepare. Uh, this is a plate here that uh, uh, shows you a visualization. Please roll to the next slide. Uh, so we have a plate uh, uh, in the, yes, thank you so much, Professor Isaac. 
So if you can see here, uh, this is the, the plan. This would be your fruits, right? Then you can integrate the fruits together with the nuts and the grains. So this would be your breakfast. And then for your lunch, you have these vegetables. You have vegetables, and then you can also include a handful of nuts here for your uh, lunch. And then for your dinner, emphasize on the seeds, on the seeds. And you can include some green leafy vegetables as well here on the seeds to make your uh, stew, to make your uh, uh, lentil stew and some other seeds, all right? You can also eat some nuts here. So then I would like to show you here in order for you to better visualize here a plan in the next slide you will see a plan, a schedule. So for example, in the, please roll to the next slide here. You may emphasize on salads. And then on the next slide, you have a table here showing you, uh, this is just a general plan so that you can plan on, on what to uh, uh, do on a daily basis. So we have here in this plan, a pre-breakfast of ginger, cinnamon, lemon tea, and then you can do this as your pre-breakfast from Monday, uh, from Sunday to Saturday. And then for your breakfast, you may have the fruit salads and some nuts here. Okay. And then your lunch could be your vegetable salads, the greens and some other vegetables. And then you can include also some nuts here. And then for your dinner, you may have, uh, for example, uh, uh, milk, uh, uh, almond milk, for example, which is a base, uh, a, which is a nut, and then you may have lentil stew or um, other seeds for your dinner. So this is a plan, all right? This is a plan that you can employ. All right, I hope that this gives you an idea how you are able to prepare your food in a helpful way integrating all those uh, foods that heal, as we mentioned in our presentation. Okay, Dr. Tamaya, just a clarification, because I remember last time, we have somebody in our audience who asked you the question about olive oil. They thought that olive oil should be taken orally, and they should take it uh, on a daily basis, would you please cl clarify on how to make use of olive oil? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Grilly, for that question. Because you see, there are those who uh, uh, who may take olive oil as is. They, they say as uh, they take a teaspoon or two or what. Uh, they don't need to do that because there are those who may have... Uh, uh, for example, they may pass out or they may feel dizzy if they take uh, the oil uh, per se. But what you can do is you can use it as a uh, salad. You can be part of your dressing. Or, for example, if you have uh, ice stew, ice stew, then the last one that you may put would be some herbs and, and a teaspoon of oil. So you can integrate that. So you don't have to uh, to take the olive oil per se in its uh, uh, liquid concentrated form, but you can integrate it with salads, okay? And then we can put it in stools. Just a teaspoon or two per day. Okay, which brings in my next question for you, Dr. Tamayo. Would you please, please briefly elaborate on the healing properties and the kinds of food that we should eat to prevent and treat heart disease? Yes, basically those that we mentioned earlier in our presentation. So we have different types of foods, but I would like uh, to, for example, if you make use of the fruits, Make use of the time when the insulin level is high. When is that? It should be in the morning. Insulin is high in the morning. So make use of the fruits for your breakfast. And if you eat the fruits, basically this uh, have 
this have uh, uh, anti uh, hypertensive properties they can remove the fatty plaques as well and that uh, uh, you may worry if you are diabetic you may worry about uh, increased uh, sugar level in the bloodstream see to it that if you eat the fruits eat um, I eat sparingly for those that have high glycemic index uh, uh, fruits, such as those tropical fruits. Those in the Philippines, basically all the fruits that are tropical, uh, pineapple, for example, bananas, they have high glycemic index. In contrast to low glycemic index, such as the berries. So make use of uh, a ratio of three is to one or two is to one. Uh, in more for uh, low glycemic uh, fruits and then less of the high glycemic fruits. So you combine them and eat them in the morning where insulin level is high in the morning. So I advise that you eat them for breakfast, but not for dinner, no fruits for dinner. Why? Because this would increase your triglyceride levels at the time because the insulin level is low. Or if uh, there is this low insulin level and you eat some fruits there and some starchy foods, this would force the pancreas to produce insulin without beyond its scheduled production of insulin. Okay. Are there any further questions? Uh, yes, uh, basically those uh, those uh, fruits and vegetables that we already mentioned in the first slide. So, for example, uh, we have uh, garlic as part of it, one to two cloves of garlic. And I mentioned, I didn't mention about uh, uh, ginger, but you can have ginger tea as well to prevent cardiovascular disease. And if you may have cardiovascular disease, you just continue on eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, as we have uh, the uh, pointed out in our schedule for healthy eating. Uh, doc, I am very convinced that food indeed has a, a direct effect in our health because uh, if you, if this is just a practical observation. If you're hungry, for example, yeah, you're weak and you're irritable and all of the things. The instant food would go to your mouth, I wonder. Uh, digestion actually has not has not done its uh, its uh, role yet because in a matter of seconds you feel nourished, and I just I just I just think that the body really reacts to food in such a fast way, and I reflect on the kind of food that we put into our bodies all these years and all of those build up. And it's it's just it's just so comforting to know that you said that, that there will be a reverse, even if there's a buildup in the arteries, uh, and if you continue to to change your lifestyle and, and couple it with exercise, of course, and trust in the Lord, there is hope for us who have uh, really uh, abused out of you know uh, lack of knowledge perhaps or a deliberate practice of uh, eating unhealthily. Now, um, I think uh, we need to emphasize, Doc, that, and it's a matter of question as well. Like, how long do you think we could be able to reverse um, a bad health practices by, by putting in religiously the health practices that, uh, that you have mentioned? For example, you have to, to change entirely your pantry or the way your, your food is being prepared. Um, do you think it's just an overnight's work or it would take years also to, to, to rebuild? Uh, any, any just like a, a general uh, idea of how that goes? Yeah, thank you for that question, Mr. Gami, because you see, uh, we develop heart disease, for example. We develop disorders through time. Uh, many, many of us develop uh, this at the time when we, uh, we reach our 30s and above, 30s, 40s, and then 50s, they, they become exaggerated. Uh, for diabetes, for example, you may develop diabetes type 1 in your 20s. And then uh, diabetes type 2, you may develop it in your 40s and above. For cardiovascular disease, you may develop it as early as 20s as well. But most of the time, uh, people develop it in their 30s, 40s and up. Now, beyond retirement, 
uh, there are people who succumb to death after they have developed uh, cardiovascular disease at the time that they were still uh, active in their careers. Now, how do they develop them? They develop them through faulty eating and unhealthy habits through the years when they are still actively uh, working in their respective professions or careers. That at the time they don't, they may not know because the manifestations or the symptoms may not be felt uh, during those years. Now, at the time when they uh, show the symptoms, many of them may be already at a point that uh, uh, they could cost their life, okay? Especially for heart attack. Heart attack, the first symptom of heart attack may be death per se. And this is uh, so sad to note that many of them may not know that they already have developed uh, this disease because they are not going to their doctors, they are not going, being tested for any of this. And uh, many of us may just uh, uh, ignore the symptoms, ignore the symptoms. And yet we still persist of uh, partaking unhealthful foods and doing unhealthy habits. And this is so sad to know that uh, after retirement, instead of enjoying uh, your retirement years, then uh, people may just simply succumb to death. And it's so sad to note here. Now the question is, is it possible for you to still reverse? Yes. And uh, the question is, how many years, how much time will it take for you to reverse those years of accumulating uh, those fatty plaques, for example, uh, those years that you have uh, had the symptoms at, uh, at least for some time, it may be silent uh, symptoms that we try to ignore or they may not be apparent. How many days, weeks, months, or years will they be reversed if you go back to healthy eating? Now, it depends also if you are 100% committed. Uh, we have seen in many of our uh, wellness participants that they could reverse uh, not totally, but there are significant results as you may you may see even in the first three weeks of going back to the original diet as God has prescribed. Uh, the fruits, the vegetables, grains, and nuts as we outlined. So if we go back to those diet, uh, those healthy diet and lifestyle, then you can see significant results within just a few weeks. And then if you continue on that one as part of your lifestyle, as your uh, lifetime commitment, then you will reap the benefits much more. So the fatty plugs can be removed in uh, a few weeks to a few months or to a few years. It depends on how, uh, uh, what the extent of how uh, it has damaged the body, but yet every disorder will have its way to have reversing these uh, conditions as we cooperate with nature, as we cooperate with God. I would like to emphasize this here, that these fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts were provided by the Creator for us to partake them and as we committedly partake them, we are actually cooperating with the healer. So it is not for the, the, the phytochemicals, the healing properties of the fruits that would heal us, but it is God who heals us. He, we are using only those properties in fruits, vegetables, grain, grains and nuts in their whole forms to heal us, but it is God who heals us. He is the healer. Thank you so much, Doctor, for the clarification. It's it's really um, comforting to know that there is still hope for our viewers, who who by this time is convinced, as I am, that diet really plays a, a major role. Um, just recently, I read of a man who made an experiment that in the last two weeks, he ate nothing but processed food. Uh, the world actually, 
uh, is starting to realize the impact of processed food in the body. And, and this guy made himself into a, a subject of his own experiment. And he said, according to, to his testimony, that there's constipation, lack of sleep, weakness, and, and all of this. So I hope that our, our, our um, listeners will not just be hearers of the word tonight, but would commit also because uh, I think help is available. I think my other co-host and Isaac would have something to ask or to contribute. Yes, um, thank you so much for thank you so much for as far as we have gone now. I just wanted to read a few comments just to show that we do engage. Um, there's Romeo who's saying thank you, church service for the lesson like this. God bless you all. And there is a question from Claudia that says that healing our body through plants is it possible to use healing plants? all the time or is there a moment when i must look for other medicine dr tomai oh yes thank you so much for the uh, question claudia uh you see uh, as i pointed out here that the uh, the the foods that i mentioned in the first few slides have healing properties they have specific phytochemicals just for us to for us to note here the word phytochemicals, uh, those uh, phytochemicals that I mentioned, uh, such as uh, uh, resveratrol, anthocyanins, and some others, phyto meaning refers to plants. And these are chemicals that we find in plants, which means that animal foods don't have these phytochemicals, in other words, because the phytochemicals are only synthesized or, or produced by plants at the time when they do the photosynthetic uh, process. We all know about the photosynthesis, right? And some of them are uh, activated with the presence of certain minerals that these plants would uh, seep from the soil, all right? And that they are integrated in the plants and the other, in, in the other uh, parts, different parts of the plant. We can take them every day through a variety of foods through a variety of foods so for example the blueberries that i mentioned as uh, the uh, uh, the teas that we can get the leaf extracts that we get them in the proper amount at the proper time they should be scheduled all right and we can take them on a daily basis the thing is if we take this and that we still persist of eating the wrong types of foods, we still persist eating, for example, animal foods, processed foods. If the plant foods in their whole form are available, why not eat them on a daily basis? But there may be cases, for example, where um, animal foods will just be more abundant where processed foods may be more abundant. Now, at least if you eat, for example, a piece of chicken and it is the one which is readily available in your place, then at least put some herbs there. For example, you find uh, cilantro, basil, uh, onions, at least you may have garlic there. Integrate them, put them as toppings to your, to your meat if meat is just the one which is abundantly available. Now, if uh, uh, what is abundantly available will be some processed foods, at least if you have them, at least eat some herbs, eat some, uh, some onions, garlic, and some others in order to basically balance the effect of uh, those that are unhealthy foods. But the emphasis here is as much as possible avoid those that are not giving you any good. So we can eat them, uh, Claudia, on a daily basis. The teas, uh, we can eat them on a daily basis on a schedule. As I said, we can use this as a pre-breakfast tonic for the teas. For the lemon, uh, garlic, or uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ginger, we can eat them as, uh, take them as teas. In the morning, one uh, cup to two cups before we take our breakfast. And those regular foods of fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts, we take them as a variety of fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. On a schedule, again, breakfast is emphasize, uh, emphasizing on the fruits and nuts. 
lunch emphasizing on vegetables, particularly the greens for lunch and some nuts as well. And then you may have the lentils, the beans, the legumes for dinner. Why the legumes and the lentils for dinner? Because at the time uh, they will be, they will give uh, nourishments for the body. It doesn't uh, allow the body to have increased sugar level because you don't need a lot of sugar when at the time we are about to go to sleep. And also if you schedule water, if you schedule water, the water should be taken uh, by about uh, the two to three cups between meals only, not during the time when you are eating. Because at the time when you are eating or immediately before or immediately after you have eaten your meal, it will dilute the digestive enzymes and it will weaken the digestive process, okay? So it should be scheduled in between meals. And let it be that the digestive system should rest for about four to five hours before you get to your next meal. And on dinner time, you have to eat your last meal by about five or six o'clock or approximately about four to five hours before you go to sleep. And those are some important rules to take note as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Tomayo. And um, our viewers, you're welcome to keep on bringing the questions as we are about to close in. Uh, Grulu, you have a question. I think I am good. I don't have any more oh. questions. Can I have one more, Doc, just before we close? You mentioned about uh, as much as possible, take in natural uh, foods in the natural form. That means we stay away from cooking them as much as possible um, and also uh, avoid frozen ones. Um, what is your advice about foods like lentils? I think we need to, to cook them a bit and okra. Uh, I've heard that there's a certain kind of temperature where at least the food, uh, um, uh, the, those uh, necessary amino acids and uh, nutrients will not be destroyed. And what is your advice, the uh, general advice on that, Doc? Yes, uh, that's a very important question, Mr. Gami, about uh, uh, cooking. You see, uh, you do away with cooking primarily for, for two reasons. First is that you do away with cooking in order not to destroy the vitamin C and vitamin B complex vitamins, the B uh, complex vitamins, because these are water soluble vitamins. And so if they are water soluble vitamins, they are heat sensitive, that even at the slightest heat, then they could be totally destroyed. And you see vitamin C and B vitamins are central in uh, a metabolism of uh, glucose and also very central as antioxidant vitamins. All right. Now, some of these uh, fat soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, vitamin E, um, and then vitamin D, they may be destroyed by heating, especially if you boil, if you process them, ultra processing, they could be destroyed as well. Now, I mentioned also about phytochemicals. Some phytochemicals are destroyed by heating. All right. So that's uh, another reason we don't want to destroy the uh, the phytochemicals. And uh, the second one is uh, that we don't cook them because cooking will alter the chemistry of the food. So for example, the oils. Why do we put the oil before, uh, after we cook the main ingredient? Because at the time, uh, uh, the when we cook it, we use it for frying, for example, for sauteing uh, and other ways uh, as we may use them, as we put them, if we bake them, for example. When we put them in that uh, particular way of cooking, you will be making uh, the good oil into a bad oil. It, you are trans, tra transforming it into, into a trans fat. So once you apply heat into the oil, then you are destroying the chemistry of it. Now for lentils, as you mentioned about lentils and some seeds, obviously they should be eaten cooked. 
That's why you have to cook them very thoroughly for the lentils. Now, in order to avoid cooking the seeds, I advise that you have to sprout them. Sprouting is important uh, for food preparation. Once you sprout them, you are breaking their dormant uh, stage. And if you are uh, uh, moving them from their dormancy to uh, their uh, life form, then uh, you are making them available for for them to release the nutrients, even if they are eaten raw. So uh, the sprouts are eaten raw, but not the seeds. Now for some grains, grains should be eaten cooked. They should be cooked because once they are not cooked, then they may cause some bloating. All right. But if you don't like them to be cooked, you can always um, uh, soak them overnight. Even the seeds, the nuts, they have to be soaked overnight in order to al allow them to imbibe water such that at the time when they imbibe water, they go back to life. And that's the time that you can eat them raw. Now, what about the okra? Uh, okra and some uh, leaves. Don't allow them to mature too much. Yeah, they have to eat it, to be eaten as young and tender so that they could be eaten raw. So for example, for, um, for tops, uh, uh, we mentioned about the momordica indica. Um, uh, uh, we, uh, I mean the, the charantia, the, uh, the bitter gourd, I mean. We use uh, the, the tops for salads. You don't have to cook it, but only get the tops of it. Those tender, young part of the leaves, but not the mature ones because you cannot just eat them raw. Except for spinach, some other uh, types of leaves, they can be eaten raw as well. Thank you, Don. And I think uh, it it, uh, it needs to be reminded that we have to watch the uncooked foods as well. Of course, it's a, it's a common, uh, common sense thing, but... Uh, now we, we we don't want to also uh, compromise our our health by getting it because I heard of someone who is uh, eating raw foods all the time and they develop um, amoebiasis because he, they, maybe they weren't able to to wash it very well. So so just a kind of reminder that uh, we um, have to do that. Um, yeah, that's I think that's very true. Considering it's it's going into the next line of my question as well. I wanted to ask Doctor Zamayu. Um, I have conversations with people who. Who, um, who are not on a plant-based diet, and they say that um, also plants nowadays, they're becoming uh, genetically modified, as also meat is also becoming genetically modified. So their point would be, but then your fruits and your vegetables are also uh, genetically modified. So what's your take on the GMOs of the fruits and vegetables? Like how how do you compare with that? Comparing with the GMOs of, of of animals, I know the animals are not healthy, but what happens with the with the vegetables as well? Yeah, thank you for that important uh, question, uh, Professor Isaac, uh, because uh, there have been controversies uh, here whether to take uh, GMOs or not. So uh, for us, primarily, we plant our own. Uh, foods in the backyard if possible. So we have some herbs, we have some vegetables in the backyard. How oh, I wish I could show them uh, here. I'm just uh, in front of my backyard now. Uh, we so should do a video later on. Yes. This is, after uh, yeah, <laughs> should, yes. Should so I, I could see those greens. I love uh, seeing the greens uh, there uh, with some of our vegetables. So they are not GMOs basically. Uh, but uh, there are uh, uh, is specific reasons why our food producers have GMOs. The first main reason is that they want to, that the plants or the animals would uh, be uh, harvested at a short time, okay, to shorten their their uh, growth period. Uh, for plants, we have what we call vegetative period, and then we have the uh, productive period. They want to shorten it. Uh, instead of having to wait for about uh, uh, three months or four months, they can wait only for a month or two. 
So it shortens uh, their the, the vegetative and the reproductive period, then they could be harvest, harvested. So that's the one reason. And the same thing with animals, they could be uh, available to be butchered um, in just a short time. So that's uh, one important reason. Another important reason why they do uh, uh, produce GMOs is that they want to integrate some genes that are that are outstanding genes from other plants or from other animals, they get them from them through what we call the genetic uh, uh, recombinant DNA technology. Uh, we do this in the lab, in the laboratory. So we just get the gene through some, uh, uh, some laboratory techniques there. We get the genes and then integrate them through laboratory techniques as well. Uh, we call this recombinant DNA technology. We put them, integrate them in the animal or in the plant. We call this as animal or plant as hosts. They become the uh, the hosts, and then the host will be multiplied. They they will they will uh, be made to produce more uh, copies of this, and that they become GMOs. And uh, the seeds of them will be distributed as GN GMO corn, or uh, we call this as BT corn. Um, now, uh, they, they, the, uh, they are integrated there for several reasons. The first reason is that we would like them to be more productive. So their yield would be higher, okay? And then the second reason is that if we integrate these genes into them, they become resistant to pests and diseases. In other words, they can produce their own innate ability to resist uh, pests and diseases, animal pests or maybe plant pests like certain bugs. They are able to resist them because they develop there some built-in mechanism of resisting them and that they, the plant will not be affected even if there are bugs there uh, such, uh, because of that they have inserted the genes there in order for the plant or the animal to resist these this pests, okay? Because these genes will allow the plant to produce certain products in order to have them resist. So those are the main reasons. There could be other reasons, but those are main reasons. Now, the question is, if these plants have this uh, resistance to pests and diseases, will they be safe for us to eat them okay now uh, there are those who would say rally against uh, gmos because they could cause the body if we partake them they could cause allergic reactions hypersensitivities and other disorders they may alter as well our genetic makeup now Normally, there is exchange of genes in plants. We call this as the natural hybridization technique, or we call this as pollination. You see, there are insects that would bring uh, the, uh, the pollen to another plant, and that is how they transfer the genes from one plant to another plant. That's a natural way. But in terms of the formation of GMOs, it is an unnatural way because we do it fast and quick and uh, more direct when we do it in the laboratory. And so this is uh, a question. How does it affect human lives? We are not sure how it affects, but if we could avoid GMOs as much as possible, the better. Let's produce our own food. Let's have our own backyard garden if it is possible for you to produce. If you don't have so much space in your backyard, you can put them in small containers and that you can produce at least some greens, some herbs, at least if you are not able to produce your own fruits, then look for those organically grown non-GMO because we are not certain if these GMOs will affect us or not. Yes. So, 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 if someone says this is 
is it better to eat the GMO f- fruits and veggies and GMO meat? The, which one do you choose? I'm not. I know that neither is better, but some people find it comfort in saying that your vegetables are also GMO. What's better than than being GMO fruits and veggies and GMO meat? Yeah, uh, for me, I still prefer those non-GMOs. Why? Because uh, the non-GMOs have higher concentration of nutrients as well. Although they may be smaller, but they have higher potencies. For example, in terms of the nutrients, uh, their vitamin C, their uh, uh, micronutrients, we find them as of higher concentration in most cases. Because if you are going to compare, uh, for example, the bulk, because uh, in, uh, in the GMOs, they may be more robust, okay? As compared to the non-GMOs, uh, those uh, n- non-organically grown as compared to organically grown, the, they, they are more robust in a sense that uh, uh, they, the yield basically is higher. But yet, if you compare it to the non-GMOs, non-organically uh, grown, or, or organically grown, I mean, those organically grown, non-GMO, they have higher potency for, for health. Meaning to say that you get more nutrients, you get more uh, concentration of phytochemicals in them. So uh, for me, I still prefer to have the non-GMO organically grown fruits and vegetables. But if we don't have any other option, we can take them, but uh, we are not certain how they could affect the body. Um, But since they are food, they are food. They are food. But if you have a preference, you prefer the non-GMO organically grown ones. Thank you so much. Um, any takeaways, Gami, as we close? Yes, very briefly. I think uh, food is really an extension of our health because it's our fuel. Without it, we can go. So it's it really matters uh, what we put into our body. And thank you so much for um, this session. Um, every day that I am being involved in this health talk, I am more convinced that we really have to, to eat healthy and, and, and practice healthy lifestyle as a form of worship and uh, as a form of stewardship for this wonderful engineering that God has given us, our bodies and our life. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamaya. Thank you so much. Uh, Grulu, do you have any takeaway and also mention yes, my take- when we're coming back? Yes, go yes, on. My takeaway is let food be thy medicine and not medicine be thy food. You see, I used to work in a setting where there is what we call polypharmacy, where patients who just have numerous variety of medications to keep them alive. And it's sad to to note that knowing that there is a way to reverse their conditions just with food. So it is better to make food a sure medicine rather than eating taking in medicines as sure food. We want to avoid polypharmacy. We would like to have a healthier lifestyle. And uh, I would like to announce that this episode is our last for the first season. We would be resuming on the the 30th of August. So, Today, I mean, beginning the 31st of May, we would not be on air, but we would be returning on the 30th of August with intermittent fasting the healthy way. And maybe Gami would like to elaborate more. Yeah, it is with a little bit of little bit of sadness that we cannot be with you next week, starting next week. But of course, uh, you know, absence makes the heart go fonder. They say. Uh, I'm sure that you will miss us as we will miss you. But you know, we are just trying to reboot, uh, as it were, as it were. We're going to. 
to collect more um, information and structure our program uh, in, 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 like, in, in, in like manner that we prepare our food with variety, with substance. And that is the reason why we are um, taking this break. It's not because we're tired. We want to serve you more. And we'd like to remind you that we'll be back on the 30th, 30th of August with more robust uh, content and, and presentation. So we'll miss you for now, but uh, we certainly would be meeting you very, very soon. Thank you so much, Gami. And uh, thank you, everyone. And um, yes, we're coming back. There's a statement that I, I visited a, a restaurant back in the days. There was a statement that was written when you're waiting for your order. It was written, good food takes time to prepare. I believe they would say that maybe because they didn't want you to, to put pressure on them, but the same thing as us. Um, good information and, and good knowledge takes time to prepare as well. So we're taking this break so that we can bring forth more information and you can all be blessed very powerful. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's joined us from the very first episode when we started the season to where we are right now. Thank you so much. This show does not exist without all of you, our viewers. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tamayo, for being an amazing presenter always. And thank you so much. And God bless you. And God adds more wisdom and knowledge to you. And thank you so much, Grulu. And thank you so much, Gami, for being an amazing co-host for this season and thank you thank you thank you i can't keep on saying thank you but i'm really really glad and grateful that uh, this show has been a success and it will continue to be extra six so i want to say thank you to everyone um i will come back i'll come back uh comes back on the 30th of august and would like to to welcome you all again a more powerful and robust uh, presentations will do will come more guests so many things are going to happen so at this very point i'll ask dr tamayo to give us a closing prayer and any comments that he has as we are about to finally close and leave for see yes again thank you so much uh, uh professor uh, uh isaac uh, uh mr gami and uh, my wife grilu uh, and of course, we miss uh, Dr. Clean and also others. Uh, also, Pastor Maxwell, we missed him in our last presentation for this first season. Um, so we are just taking a break, as we said. It's going to be a summer break, uh, three months, uh, starting May 30. Up to uh, we will have the next, the first episode of season two on August 30, as we mentioned. It saddens us to a point uh, that will not be on air, but there will be a training that will occupy the same spot of this uh, of this uh, time slot from 11.30 to 1, uh, but please don't miss it. Um, and uh, as uh, they said that it will be a reboot, basically, to prepare more uh, more uh, foods for you to uh, to partake when we will come back and um, aside from just mere talks like this we will be having some symposia as dr moon uh, our leader here uh, has uh, given me some some uh, ideas on how we could improve uh, so we will have symposia we may have some food preparation demonstrations as well in our presentations. Uh, what else? Some other ways, panel discussion, that we may have a venue for panel discussion and some other ways. So uh, please give us time to reboot for three months. It will be just short and we will be coming back. And thank you for all our viewers who have been following us please anticipate our comeback our comeback august 30 we will do the intermittent fasting the the healthy way all right and thank you of course to uh, all our organizers of the jesus live that io uh, the team uh, thank you so much for supporting us in our presentations we'll see you again all right let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer father we thank you that we have finished uh, season one and this is the final uh, uh, presentation of season one 
but we look forward to Father for season two. After our summer break for three months, we will uh, be uh, giving our best again of Father. And uh, this uh, break will be not really a break for us, but it will be a preparation and a supplication, Father, as you will impress to us what we will do in the next uh, episodes and in the next presentations. We ask you, O oh Father, to bless all our viewers. Bless them. If they have challenges in their, uh, in their lives, O oh Father, if they are beset with uh, health issues, if they is, are beset with financial issues, maybe relation, uh, relational issues as well, Lord, please touch them with a healing hand so that they will be made whole, both physically, spiritually, and mentally as well. Lord, we believe that you are coming very soon, that as we prepare for the soon return, Father, may we develop the character of Jesus vested upon us. And that, oh, Father, uh, we look forward to the time when we will live life eternity with thee, where there will be no more uh, challenges that may beset us, but we will be with thee forevermore. Bless the team, bless our health talk team, and bless each one of us, Father, that we will be more consecrated upon you as we are committed to live life with a double portion of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everyone. And my final remarks, as always, we are, bought, we are not of our own. We are bought at a price in the blood of Jesus, and we're created by God, the giver of life, and health is a choice. Let us then choose to be healthy. God bless us all and see you soon again. And like likewise as Jesus Life, we end with, with our motto, just to remind our viewers who we are. And as Jesus Life, we are prayer warriors. Prayer warriors. We are ambassadors of love. Ambassadors of love. We are fearless leaders. Fearless leaders. And we are powerful missionaries. Powerful missionaries. Thank you so much, everyone. Us in the Jesus Life team, we say bye, everyone. Bye-bye.